And that class is why you should never attempt to milk a Zarblat without proper protective gear drone Professor Zix-9, his seven eye stalks drooping with boredom, as he concluded yet another mind-numbing safety lecture. The classroom of alien students, representing a dozen different species from across the galaxy, collectively suppressed a grain, well, except for Blorp, the amorphous blob from Goo Prime, who couldn't groan if his life depended on it. He just sort of squished, disappointedly. Now continued Zix-9, his voice as monotonous as a Vaughan poetry reading, we have a special guest lecturer today. Please welcome Professor Jane Davidson, a human from the death world Earth. The door slid open with a hiss, and in walked a short, stocky creature with alarmingly few limbs and an unsettling lack of tentacles. The alien students recoiled slightly, their natural instincts screaming danger at the sight of the death worlder. Thanks for having me, said Jane, flashing a smile that exposed her terrifying bone daggers. I mean teeth. I'm here to give you a practical demonstration on handling hostile life forms. Glicks, a spindly arachnoid from Webworld Prime, raised a trembling appendage. Excuse me, Professor Davidson, but isn't your entire species considered a hostile life form? Jane's laughter echoed through the room, causing several students to instinctively activate their defense mechanisms. Blort formed a protective bubble, while Zizz, the insectoid from High Five, buzzed nervously. Oh, you're not wrong there, Glix Jane chuckled, wiping a tear from her eye. But today, we're going to focus on something a bit more challenging. With that, she reached into a large, reinforced container and pulled out what appeared to be a writhing mass of fur, claws, and pure, unadulterated rage. Holy Xenu's tentacles shrieked Flibbit, the amphibious student from Swamp Nine. Is that a terrifying from the depths of Nightmare Prime? Jane held the creature at arm's length, dodging its attempts to separate her face from the rest of her head. Nope, even better. This, my dear students, is what we earthlings call a cat. The room fell silent, save for the growls and hisses emanating from the cat. Even Professor Zix-9 seemed at a loss for words, which was quite a feat considering he had three mouths. Now, I know what you're thinking, Jane continued, casually avoiding a swipe from the cat's razor-sharp claws. Why would anyone willingly bring such a vicious predator into their home? Well, that's what we're here to explore today. Glix's exoskeleton rattled nervously. Explore. Professor, with all due respect, shouldn't we be running for our lives? Jane laughed again, causing Blorp to quiver anxiously in his protective bubble. Oh, Glix, where's your sense of adventure? Now, who wants to learn how to pet a cat? The entire class took a collective step back, leaving poor Zed's at the front. His antennae twitched in panic as Jane approached with the squirming ball of fury. Excellent volunteer, Zed's Jane beamed, completely ignoring the insectoid's obvious distress. Now, the key to petting a cat is confidence. They can smell fear, you know. Zest's buzzed frantically. But Professor, I'm an insect. We're literally programmed to fear everything. Nonsense, Jane declared, gently guiding one of Zedst's trembling appendages towards the cat. Just reach out slowly. And. The moment Zedst's feeler made contact with the cat's fur, several things happened at once. The cat let out a yowl that would have put a banshee to shame. Zedst emitted a high-pitched shriek that shattered three of Professor Zix-9's eye stalks, and Blorp's protective bubble burst, showering the front row with goo. See. Not so bad, right, Jane said cheerfully, as if she hadn't just initiated interstellar chaos in a classroom. Zest, now missing two antennae and sporting several claw marks on his exoskeleton, buzzed weakly in response. Now, who wants to learn about the joy of belly rubs, Jane asked, turning to face the rest of the class. The students, having witnessed the fate of their brave if unwilling classmate, were now huddled in the far corner of the room. Even Blorp, who normally took up a quarter of the classroom, had compressed himself into a space the size of a textbook. Oh, come on, Jane cajoled, still wrestling with the cat. Where's your scientific curiosity? This is a unique opportunity to study one of Earth's most beloved pets. Flibbit, who had been cowering behind his desk, cautiously raised a webbed hand. Professor Davidson, I don't mean to be rude, but are you insane? That creature is clearly trying to murder you. Jane glanced down at the cat, which was now attempting to disembowel her forearm. Oh, this? This is just how Mr. Whiskers shows affection. You should see him when he's actually angry. The alien students exchanged horrified glances. What kind of hellscape was Earth, where such creatures were considered pets? Now Jane continued. Apparently oblivious to the blood trickling down her arm, let's talk about the nutritional requirements of a cat. Who can guess what they eat? Glix, still trembling but unable to resist the allure of scientific inquiry, hesitantly spoke up. Based on its behavior and physical characteristics, I would hypothesize that it subsists on the fear and suffering of other sentient beings. Jane burst out laughing causing Mr. Whiskers to redouble his efforts to separate her hand from her wrist. Close, but not quite. They're actually obligate carnivores. In the wild, they hunt and eat small animals. As pets, we usually feed them processed meat products. The class collectively gasped. Flibbit turned an even paler shade of green. 
You mean, you willingly bring these predators into your homes and then provide them with meat? Zezd buzzed incredulously, still nursing his wounds. Of course, Jane replied cheerfully. We even have entire stores dedicated to pet food and accessories. Now, who wants to try feeding Mr. Whiskers a treat? The resulting silence was so profound that you could have heard a Sneezian flea drop, which, incidentally, Sneezian fleas do with alarming regularity and catastrophic results. No volunteers. Well, I guess I'll have to demonstrate, Jane said with a shrug. She reached into her pocket and pulled out a small, fish-shaped object. The moment Mr. Whiskers caught sight of the treat, his entire demeanor changed. The once feral beast suddenly transformed into a purring, kneading ball of fluff. The alien students watched in awe as the cat delicately took the treat from Jane's hand, then proceeded to rub against her legs affectionately. See, he's just a big softy Jane cooed, scratching Mr. Whiskers behind the ears. Blob, who had finally regained enough courage to reform into his usual blob shape, oozed forward curiously. Fascinating. The creature appears to have multiple behavioral states. Is this common among Earth fauna? Jane nodded still petting the now docile Mr. Whiskers. Oh, absolutely. Earth animals, including humans, can be quite unpredictable. It's part of what makes our planet so exciting. Exciting isn't quite the word I'd use, muttered Professor Zix-9, who had finally managed to regenerate his shattered eye stalks. Terrifying, perhaps. Or possibly suicidal. Now, now, Professor Jane chided gently, don't knock it till you've tried it. In fact, why don't you give Mr. Whiskers a little pet? He's calm now. See? Zix-9's eye stalks all swiveled to focus on the cat, which was now contentedly licking its paws. With visible reluctance, the professor extended one trembling tentacle towards Mr. Whiskers. The entire class held their breath, except for Blorb, who didn't have lungs as Zix-9's tentacle made contact with the cat's fur. For a moment, nothing happened. Then, to everyone's amazement, Mr. Whiskers began to purr. It it vibrates, Zix-9 asked, a note of wonder creeping into his usually monotonous voice. That's right, Jane said with a smile. That's how cats show they're happy and content. Emboldened by their professor's success, the students began to inch closer, their curiosity overcoming their fear. Even Zed, still sporting battle scars from his earlier encounter, buzzed forward for a better look. Remarkable glicks chittered, extending one spindly leg to gently touch Mr. Whiskers' tail. The texture is most unusual. And you say these creatures serve no practical purpose in human dwellings? Jane shook her head. Not in the traditional sense, no. They don't guard our homes or help us hunt. We keep them simply because we enjoy their company. Flibbit, who had finally emerged from behind his desk, blinked his bulbous eyes in confusion. But why? They seem dangerous and unpredictable. Ah, but that's part of their charm, Jane explained, her eyes twinkling. Cats are independent, mysterious, and yes, sometimes a bit dangerous. But they're also affectionate, playful, and endlessly fascinating. In many ways, they're not so different from humans. The aliens pondered this for a moment, watching as Mr. Whiskers rolled onto his back, exposing his belly in a show of trust. Would, would it be acceptable if I attempted to provide a belly rub blob, asked hesitantly, a pseudopod already stretching towards the cat's exposed stomach. Jane's eyes widened. Ah, blob, I'm not sure that's the best. But it was too late. Ta. The moment blob's gooey appendage made contact with Mr. Whiskers' belly, the cat's eyes dilated, and in a flash of fur and claws, it latched onto the unfortunate alien. What followed was a scene that would have put most action Holovids to shame. Mr. Whiskers, apparently under the impression that Blorp was some sort of giant, mobile cat toy, proceeded to bounce around the classroom, using the gelatinous alien as a combination trampoline and scratch post. Students scattered in all directions, desks were overturned, and poor Professor Zix-9's newly regenerated eye stalks were once again at risk as the cat blob whirlwind tore through the room. Fascinating Jane shouted over the chaos, furiously taking notes. I've never seen a cat interact with a non-Newtonian fluid-based lifeform before. The possibilities for cross-species play behaviors are endless. Is this? Normal Glicks asked, clinging to the ceiling with all eight legs. Oh, absolutely, Jane replied enthusiastically. Well, the playing part at least. The non-Newtonian fluid playmate is a new variable. After what seemed like an eternity but was actually closer to five minutes, Mr. Whiskers finally tired himself out. He detached from the thoroughly mauled blorp and sauntered back to Jane, looking immensely pleased with himself. Blorp, for his part, seemed more bewildered than harmed. He reformed into his usual shape, now sporting several cat-shaped indentations. That was invigorating, he burbled, sounding somewhat dazed. As the dust settled and the students cautiously emerged from their hiding spots, Jane cleared her throat. Well... I hope this demonstration has given you all a new perspective on Earth's fauna and the uh, unique challenges of human pet ownership. The aliens looked at each other, then at the smugly preening Mr. Whiskers, and finally at their battered classroom. Slowly, almost reluctantly, Zidst raised a wing. Yes, 
just Jane asked. Professor Davidson, the insectoid, began hesitantly. I have a question that I believe I speak for the entire class in asking. Go on, Jane encouraged. Zidst's antennae twitched nervously. Where, where can we get one? Jane's jaw dropped. I'm sorry, what? A cat flibbit chimed in, his initial terror now replaced with excited curiosity. Where can we acquire one of these fascinating creatures? But, but they tried to kill you, Jane sputtered, looking around the room in disbelief. Zdidst, you're missing antennae. Blorp was used as a feline trampoline. Professor Zix-9 had to regenerate body parts. The alien students glanced at each other, then back at Jane Glix, still clinging to the ceiling, spoke up. With all due respect, Professor Davidson, we've just witnessed a creature that can go from murderous rage to affectionate purring in the span of seconds. It defied all our preconceptions about predator-prey relationships and demonstrated problem-solving skills in figuring out how to play with Blorp from a scientific standpoint. It's the most intriguing organism we've encountered in our xenobiology studies. Not to mention Blorp added, still looking a bit wobbly, the adrenaline rush was quite invigorating. I haven't felt this alive since I accidentally fell into a black hole during my quantum physics field trip. Jane looked from the eager faces of the alien students to the smug countenance of Mr. Whiskers, who was now calmly grooming himself as if he hadn't just turned the classroom into a war zone. She couldn't help but laugh. Well, she said, shaking her head in amazement, I suppose I shouldn't be surprised. Humans have been captivated by cats for thousands of years. Why should aliens be any different? She reached down to scratch Mr. Whiskers behind the ears, earning a contented purr. Tell you what, why don't we make this a regular class? Introduction to Earth Pets 101. We can cover cats, dogs, hamsters, maybe work our way up to more exotic pets like tarantulas or pythons. The excited buzz, both literal and figurative, that filled the room was all the answer she needed. As Jane began to outline the curriculum for their new class, with Mr. Whiskers now contentedly curled up on her lap, she couldn't help but smile. She had come here to teach aliens about Earth's creatures, but in the process, she had learned something too. It seemed that the desire to bond with animals, even potentially dangerous ones, wasn't unique to humans after all. Perhaps this shared fascination with the wild and unpredictable was a universal constant, transcending the boundaries of species and planets. And who knew? Maybe this was the start of a beautiful interstellar friendship, built on a foundation of mutual respect, scientific curiosity, and a healthy appreciation for the chaos that a single house kit could unleash. As the class eagerly discussed the possibility of a field trip to Earth's pet shops with appropriate safety measures, of course, Jane made a mental note to stock up on band-aids and alien-safe antihistamines. Something told her this was going to be an interesting semester. After all, they hadn't even gotten to the part about litter boxes yet. As the excitement in the classroom reached fever pitch, a low, ominous rumble suddenly echoed through the room. The alien students froze, their various appendages, tentacles and sensory organs twitching nervously. What was that flibbit croaked? his amphibious skin turning an even more vibrant shade of green. Is the creature preparing for another attack? Jane cocked her head, listening intently. The rumble came again, louder this time, accompanied by a slight tremor that made the desks rattle. Her eyes widened in recognition. Oh no, she muttered, glancing at her watch. I completely lost track of time. What is it? Professor Davidson Glicks chittered anxiously from his perch on his perch on the... Is there another, larger earth predator about to burst through the wall? Jane couldn't help but chuckle despite the growing urgency of the situation. Not exactly Glicks, but we might be in for an even bigger challenge than Mr. Whiskers here. As if on cue, the classroom door slid open with a pneumatic hiss. The alien students collectively held their breath, except for Blorp, who still didn't have lungs as a figure stepped through the doorway. To their surprise, it wasn't another terrifying earth creature, but a tall, lanky human male with wild, unkempt hair and thick-rimmed glasses perched precariously on his nose. Jane the newcomer exclaimed, his voice filled with equal parts excitement and exasperation. I've been looking all over for you. Don't tell me you forgot about the faculty potluck. Jane face palmed, eliciting a startled meow from Mr. Whiskers. Oh crud. I'm so sorry Dave I got caught up in giving this demonstration and completely lost track of time. The alien students watched this exchange with growing confusion and curiosity. Zidst, his antennae now partially regrown, buzzed questioningly. Professor Davidson, who is this new human? And what is a... Potluck. Dave's eyes widened as he finally took in the scene before him, a classroom full of alien students in various states of dishevelment, a smug-looking cat, and what appeared to be the aftermath of a small-scale war. Jane, he said slowly, what exactly have you been teaching these poor students? Before Jane could respond, Blorp oozed forward, his gelatinous form still bearing faint cat-shaped indentations. Greetings, new human Dave, we have been learning about the fascinating and terrifying creatures you call cats. Would you perhaps be willing to demonstrate another Earth pet for us? Perhaps something even more dangerous? Dave's jaw dropped. He turned to Jane, who was trying and failing to suppress a grin. You brought Mr. Whiskers to class? Are you insane? Oh, come on, Jane retorted, scratching the cat behind the ears. It was a valuable learning experience. Just look how engaged the students are. 
Dave glanced around the room, taking in the mixture of terror, awe, and unbridled curiosity on the alien faces. Despite himself, he felt a smile tugging at the corners of his mouth. Well, he said, shaking his head in disbelief, I suppose I can't keep with results, but we really should get going. The potluck's about to start, and you know how Professor Silophone gets when people are late. At the mention of Professor Saglophone, the alien students perked up even more. Flibbit, who had finally regained some of his normal coloration, raised a webbed hand. Excuse me, new human Dave, he croaked. But did you say Professor Silophone? Is that an earth instrument that has achieved sentience and a teaching position? Dave burst out laughing while Jane tried to stifle her giggles. No, no, Dave explained, wiping tears of mirth from his eyes. That's just our nickname for Professor Selop Nix. He's from a crystalline species that communicates through resonant frequencies. When he talks, it sounds a bit like a acylophone being played. The alien students exchanged glances, their eyes or equivalent sensory organs wide with wonder. Glix, still clinging to the ceiling, spoke up. Fascinating. So, Earth humans assign nicknames based on auditory similarities to inanimate objects. Is this a common practice? Jane nodded, still chuckling. Oh, you have no idea. Humans will nickname anything and everything. It's part of our charm. And our ability to constantly confuse other species, Dave added with a wink. Now, come on, Jane, we really should get going. Unless he trailed off a mischievous glint in his eye. Jane raised an eyebrow. Unless what? Dave grinned, turning to address the class. Well, students? How would you like to experience another unique Earth tradition? One that combines social interaction, potential danger, and the fascinating world of human cuisine. The classroom erupted into a cacophony of excited chittering, buzzing, and squishing. Even Professor Zix-9, who had been quietly regrowing his eye stalks in the corner, perked up at the mention of danger and cuisine. Jane's eyes widened as she realized what Dave was suggesting. Dave, no, we can't possibly. Why not Dave countered? You've already introduced them to the chaos of cat ownership. Why not go all in and show them the beautiful disaster that is an academic potluck? For a moment, Jane looked like she was going to argue. Then, a slow smile spread across her face. You know what? You're absolutely right. Students. Field trip. The alien students cheered or made their species equivalent of a cheer. Blort formed himself into a rough approximation of a party hat, while Zed's wings buzzed in excitement. But Jane added, holding up a hand for silence, we need to establish some ground rules. First, no eating anything without checking with me or Dave first. Earth food can be unpredictable for alien digestive systems. Second Dave chimed in, if you see Professor Sedzilophone approaching with his famous crystal casserole run, don't ask questions, just run. The students nodded solemnly, although it was clear from their expressions that they had no idea what a casserole was or why it might necessitate running. And finally Jane concluded, scooping up Mr. Whiskers, we stick together. The faculty lounge can be a jungle, even for us humans. Stay close and whatever you do, don't make eye contact with anyone from the theoretical physics department. They'll trap you in a conversation about string theory for hours. With these ominous warnings in place, the motley crew set off down the hallways of the Galactic University, leaving behind a battered classroom and a very confused and slightly singed cleaning droid. As they walked, the alien students peppered Jane and Dave with questions about Earth customs, potluck etiquette, and the mysterious crystal casserole Dave, for his part, seemed to be thoroughly enjoying the chance to share some of Earth's more colorful traditions. And that's why you should never, ever mention the words pineapple and pizza in the same sentence at an academic gathering, he concluded. Just as they reached the doors of the faculty lounge, the alien students looked equal parts terrified and thrilled. Glix, who had reluctantly descended from the ceiling to join the field trip, raised a trembling appendage. Professor Davidson, new human Dave, he chittered nervously. Are you certain this is safe? It sounds as though this potluck might be more dangerous than facing a plasma storm on Zeta Reticuli. Jane and Dave exchanged glances then burst out laughing. Oh, Glix, Jane said, wiping away a tear of mirth, you have no idea how right you are, but don't worry. That's half the fun. With that, she pushed open the doors, and the group was immediately assaulted by a cacophony of sounds, smells, and sights that defied description. The faculty lounge had been transformed into a bizarre mishmash of cultural touchstones from across the galaxy. In one corner, a group of gaseous entities from the nebula cluster were engaged in what appeared to be a heated debate about grading curves, their arguments punctuated by colorful bursts of noxious gases. Near the window, a collection of silicon-based lifeforms were attempting to interface with the coffee machine, their crystalline structures vibrating with caffeine-induced excitement. And in the center of the room, Surrounded by a veritable fortress of potluck dishes, stood Professor Silophone himself. The crystalline being was emitting a series of melodic tones that, to the untrained ear, sounded like a axylophone being played by an over-caffeinated octopus. Ah, Dave whispered, a note of dread in his voice. It appears Professor Silophone is trying to convince everyone to try his crystal casserole. Brace yourselves, students. This could get ugly. 
As if on cue, a harried-looking faculty member rushed past them, clutching their midsection and moaning something about interdimensional indigestion. The alien students watched this scene unfold with a mixture of horror and fascination. Blorp, who had been maintaining his party hat shape, suddenly lost cohesion and puddled on the floor. This he burbled weakly, is simultaneously the most terrifying and exhilarating experience of my life. Jane couldn't help but grin. Welcome to Earth Culture 101, kids. Now, who wants to try some of my famous five-alarm chili? What followed was a whirlwind of culinary chaos and cultural exchange that would go down in galactic university history. The alien students, emboldened by their earlier encounter with Mr. Whiskers, threw themselves into the potluck experience with gusto. Jids discovered a newfound love for spicy foods, much to the alarm of his hiver mates back on Hive 5. Glicks, after some coaxing, found that his multiple limbs made him an excellent multitasker, balancing plates of food from a dozen different planets with ease. Even Blorp got into the spirit, shape-shifting into various eating utensils to help his classmates navigate the more challenging dishes. As the evening wore on, the initial trepidation gave way to genuine camaraderie. Alien faculty members, intrigued by the presence of students at the potluck, began sharing stories of their own worlds and cultures. Professor Silofone, after finally admitting defeat with his crystal casserole, turned out to be a fascinating conversationalist. His melodic tones, once translated, revealed a wry sense of humor and a wealth of knowledge about galactic history. Jane and Dave watched all of this unfold with a sense of pride and amusement. Mr. Whiskers, for his part, had found a sunny spot on a windowsill and was contentedly ignoring the chaos around him. You know, Dave said, nudging Jane as they watched Flibbit attempt to explain the concept of a toast to a group of photosynthetic beings. I think you might have started something here. Jane raised an eyebrow. Oh, and what's that? Dave grinned. A revolution in interspecies education. I mean, look at them. A few hours ago they were terrified of a housecat. Now they're swapping recipes with beings from across the galaxy and debating the finer points of exonobiology over questionable casseroles. Jane looked around the room, taking in the sight of her students fully immersed in the beautiful chaos of the potluck. Glix was animatedly explaining the concept of pizza to a group of fungal entities, while Zez buzzed excitedly about the possibilities of incorporating earth spices into High Five's nutrient paste. Even Professor Zix-9, who had spent most of the evening lurking near the punch bowl, seemed to be enjoying himself. He was engaged in what appeared to be a lively discussion about tentacle care with a cephalopodian professor from the marine biology department. You're right, Jane said softly, a warm smile spreading across her face. This is so much more than I ever expected when I brought Mr. Whiskers to class. As if summoned by the mention of his name, the cat in question let out a loud meow. The room fell silent for a moment, dozens of alien eyes and other sensory organs turning to focus on the small furry creature. Then, to everyone's surprise, Professor Silophone began to emit a series of soft, melodic tones that sounded remarkably like a purr. Mr. Whiskers' ears perked up, and he leapt gracefully from his windowsill perch to investigate this new musical being. The entire faculty lounge watched in awe as Cat and Crystalline Professor regarded each other with mutual curiosity. Then, in a moment that would be talked about for semesters to come, Mr. Whiskers delicately placed a paw on one of Professor Xylophone's resonating surfaces. The resulting sound was unlike anything anyone had ever heard before, a perfect harmony of feline purr and crystalline resonance that seemed to bridge the gap between Earth and the far-flung corners of the galaxy. Slowly, conversations resumed, but there was a newfound sense of unity in the room. Barriers that had seemed insurmountable just hours ago were crumbling in the face of shared experiences, questionable potluck dishes, and the universal appeal of a contented cat. As the evening began to wind down, Jane gathered her students, who were now buzzing some literally with excitement about their next class. Well, she said, unable to keep the pride out of her voice, I hope you've all learned something today about Earth, its creatures, and its cultures. Blorp, who had finally managed to maintain a stable form again, oozed forward. Oh, we've learned so much, Professor Davidson, but I think the most important lesson is this, whether you're a death worlder, a crystalline being, or a gelatinous blob, there's nothing quite like sharing a meal, no matter how potentially hazardous, to bring people together. The other students murmured and buzzed and squished their agreement. Even Professor Zix-9 nodded his eye stalks approvingly. Jane felt a lump form in her throat. You know, blorp. I couldn't have said it better myself. Now, who's ready for next week's class? I was thinking we could cover the fascinating world of Earth sports. Anyone up for learning about something called extreme ironing? The resulting cheer and various alien approximations thereof was so loud that it caused several of Professor Silophone's crystals to resonate sympathetically. As Jane led her students back to the classroom, already planning future lessons and field trips, she couldn't help but feel that she had stumbled upon something truly special. In bringing a simple housecat to class, she had inadvertently opened up a whole new world of interspecies understanding. It wasn't just about teaching aliens about Earth anymore, it was about breaking down barriers, challenging preconceptions, 
and fostering a sense of galactic community. And if that community happened to be built on a foundation of mutual terror, questionable potluck dishes, and an appreciation for furry earth predators, well, that was just fine by her. As they reached the classroom, Jane turned to face her students one last time. Remember, class, next week we'll be covering earth idioms, so put on your thinking caps, keep your eyes peeled, and be ready to learn. And yes, I'll explain what all of those phrases mean. The students laughed, a delightful cacophony of alien sounds that filled the hallway. As they filed into the classroom, chattering excitedly about their adventures, Jane caught Dave's eye. You know, she said with a grin, I think this might be the start of a beautiful, if slightly chaotic, academic career. Dave chuckled, reaching down to scratch Mr. Whiskers behind the ears. Jane, my dear, I think you might have just revolutionized intergalactic education, one terrifying earth pet at a time. And with that, the door closed on another day at Galactic University, a day that had started with fear and confusion, but ended with understanding, laughter, and the unshakable certainty that sometimes the best way to learn about the universe was to dive headfirst into its wonderful, unpredictable chaos.